Welcome to the King's Men Podcast with Pastor Paul from Set Free Life Church. This is the place to come for real talk from real men that want real results from a real Jesus. Stay tuned. Everybody, it's Pastor Paul once again, your Set Free Life Coach, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the King's Men. I got my co-host, my homeboy, my armor bearer, my right hand man. I got Juan Frias in the house. So, Juan, introduce yourself, and let's get this show rocking, brother. Good morning. This is Juan Frias with Set Free Life Church. Uh, we we're hosting and uh, launching the King's Men Ministry. Um, I come from a background of uh, street uh, money, greed women um all the stuff that uh, we all dealt with <laughs> cars everything uh going to um a place where i actually had to bring myself to reality and and look at uh, um my future in a different way well we just want you to um understand and know that this whole show is really geared back to the whole thing of bringing the grip back into a man and so the whole atmosphere that we're in right now is uh is a very, um, very simple place, very rebellious place. And we were just talking to who we're going to interview today. We have Ryan Griffith uh, with us in the Set Free Lab. And so we're just going to really, truly just break down real talk. We're going to share testimonies. Um, I'm feeling a little bit under the weather, so I'm going to let you all just rock. You know what I'm saying? And when, when I feel like I need to jump in, then I'm going to jump in. But um, we just really want to share with the world right now. And if you're on iTunes, do us a huge favor and hit that subscribe button, share it out and um, drop us a review as well. Because once we get 30 reviews, then we're on a whole different level on iTunes. And if you're on Spotify or iHeartRadio, um, do us a huge favor and share that out with your friends, your families, download it, do what you do, share it on Facebook and let's get this word out because it's time that the King's men rise up and be who God's called us to be. You know, Joshua 1 and 9 talks about be yet be strong and courageous. And so what God is really telling Joshua is, look, everything that I told Moses, I'm imparting it in you, right? And so I think one of the areas that we lack, especially in Christianity, and I'm not here to bash any churches or any ministries, but the reality is this, is that we've lost our grit. Our leadership has dwindled in so many areas because we're self-taught. Like our screens on our phones are discipling our kids, yeah. period, because we're in what we call the digital Babylon. I'm reading this book right now. I forget the author's name, David Kinnaman, and it's called Faith for Exiles. And it talks about how we're still living in Babylon, yeah. just like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, all that whole realm. It's like the whole world is gathered because of technology. And so we just want you to understand that this show is really, truly geared of number one, having real talk, real conversation and bringing the grit back into the atmosphere. So I want to introduce uh, a very good friend of mine that, you know what, honestly, I haven't seen this dude in like eight years, man. Um, and his name is Ryan Griffin. And I'm just going to let him introduce himself. Let us know where you hail from. Um, let's talk about what you need to talk about. And let's get the show rocking, brother. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I want to give you a, sh a huge thank. This is an honor. This is a, a divinely odd privilege to be here <laughs> because I think, like you're saying, we haven't seen you in about eight years. Um, as a as a young adult, I do come from a background of of street, and and when I mean street, it's it's the most unglorious thing. I was a right. uh, a drug addict. I was not uh, a, a poster child of, of a thug. I was a, I was a loser, no dignity. Uh, dropped out in seventh grade, uh, in and out of juvenile rehab. Wow. Um, was homeless, full blown homeless at fifteen. Mm -hmm. um, and I I had a, a, a broken house, uh, a, a father that. Uh, necessarily wasn't uh, equipped and adapt to be a discipling father in Christ. Right. Uh, and uh, basically, I lived my whole life uh, under that just delusion, depression, uh, just rebellious towards God. And I, I ended up going to a ministry uh, called Victory Temple. Uh, did a did a program there for six months. I left, and I you know just seeked. Uh, I relocated back to HEB. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, going to church, uh, but it did get to a point to where I needed that that gritty leadership from another man, that mentorship that somebody that wasn't afraid to get in my face and say, hey, 
uh, you're wrong. Uh, right. I love you. Don't do this. Do this. Good job. Bad job. And uh, I thought that I was able to function outside of the accountability of a local church and that type of mentorship. And it ended up crashing. Um, mm. uh, and in fact, I, you probably don't know that I'm going to bring this up, but I don't know if you remember, but at 21, I, was, I, I called you. And I, the reason I called you is because everyone I called kind of gave me this runaround religious uh, answer about what I was going through, and you right. didn't give me that at all. <laughs> uh, of course, it, it, you know, uh, you know, and that was a personal conversation between me and you. But you did not spare the grit and saying to, to be straight up with me, and I, and I and I needed that at that time. So, um, you know, in repentance, I heard God speak to me um, in, in such a way through Luke fifteen, uh, and I repented. And I, I went back to Victory Temple, and I submitted myself to that leadership. I got under a pastor. I got under the men of God that were on my level as far as were able to and equipped to minister to me. And I needed someone in my face, and, I, and at that time, that's what I needed. And at that time, repentance for me was going back to the only body that I that that I, I, I that knew me right. and was a church to me and loved me and held me accountable, disciplined me. Um, I don't, I don't, I, you know, today's culture is very uh, interesting because we're more worried about obeying the eleventh commandment, mm. uh, and the eleventh commandment is "Thou shalt be nice." And <laughs> right. um, I didn't need nice, and, right. and, and I don't, I don't mean I needed rude and unorthodox and unbiblical, but I needed, I needed a, you know, discipline. Really? I needed someone to say, "Hey, you need, I, I need to get you wrong. Don't do this. Here's the consequence. You're not going to, as a disciple, don't do this." And I needed that that level of accountability, that superintendence, that. Um, you know, I needed that at that time, and so uh, I, I was there since uh, since 2013. Mm-hmm. I just recently left. I, I have an engagement. I uh, just got engaged, but I, while I was there, I grew. Um, I grew in my understanding of the gospel, who Christ is, right. who I am, and identity, the truth. Uh, that place cultivated in me a, a love for the Word of God. Right. And truth, and and it, and cultivated me a character that said I would stand on truth no matter the consequence. Right. Uh, and so, uh, I recent engagement, I stepped down from my leadership position al- along with some other reasons that are not necessary to discuss. Right. Uh, but um, I stepped down, and I just recently transitioned. I'm about to get married with uh, uh, the, my best friend, awesome, awesome lady uh, named Heather, and and so I'm now. Uh, in a position to where um, I'm, I'm looking for a local body. Uh, I'm discovering uh, who I am as a man, uh, right. and my identity is not wrapped up in a ministry or in Come a on. position, uh, but it's wrapped up in who Christ is. And uh, and I pray that God, you know, develops the character in me that I stand for the truth. Come on, uh, and if it offends, I I hope to speak truth with each one of my neighbor in love. Right, uh, you, you know, uh, it's truth without love is like Boaz without Ruth. You don't get Christ from it, <laughs> right. uh, and and I and I and so um, I thank God He's developing that character in me, and, and that's what I want to do. So I'm here. Uh, I'm uh, I'm excited uh, to be here. It's 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 a weird honor to be here because uh, if you were to ask me uh, three years ago if I'd be if I'd be on Paul Rivera's uh, podcast, I hope I said your last name right. If I'd be on your <laughs> podcast, I would probably say, uh, "No, that'd be crazy." No, why would I be? Because you know, you just don't know where God's taken us. Right. Uh, we don't know the future. I think James says, "If you you say you're going to go here and sell this for a profit, do you not know your boasting is evil?" And Amen. and because we don't know where we're going, so I don't boast in tomorrow. I'll I'll, I'll let God lead lead me, but at the same time, I'm going to strategize, be mature. Uh, and plan stuff out, and so this is where I'm at, and so it's an exciting, scary, awesome place, uh, and then uh, just want to give God all the glory because he saved me. I was an addict, worthless, and, uh-huh. and through the preaching of the gospel, I was reborn, uh, and I was discipled, and I, I'm a new creation, and I'm living that out, and so it's it's Amen. interesting. Well, I just want to uh, give you a shout out and thank you. Um, I don't remember the conversation, but I do remember that phone call. Um, it was one of those phone calls. It was the last phone call that we had had until I had seen you, I believe it was on Instagram and, you know, seeing you go through your, through your process. And I think it was about a year ago or even a little bit more. You had messaged me on Instagram and said, Hey man, I just want to thank you for being that real dude in my life at that moment. I'm good now. 
You know what I'm saying? And I literally came home and told Holly, I was like, hey, you remember Ryan? She's like, yeah. I was like, man, he's he's rocking it. He's doing his thing. And so I love what you said, though, man, because I'm a word guy. Truth without love is like Boaz without Ruth. You won't have no Christ. Bro, I've never heard it like that. Mm -hmm. That right there, drop the mic, it'll preach because it's true, man. Like truth without love is like that unity without Boaz and Ruth, Christ will never come. And so I just want to thank you, bro, for, um, for coming on the show and really sharing your heart because I see the change. Like I haven't seen you in seven years and, you know, walking up to my house going, what the heck? This dude got beard, losing his hair, <laughs> you know, uh, about to get married. Yeah, I mean, man. it's just, it's just it sounds amazing. about right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, um, I like what you said about, People not mincing words. My dude Juan here will attest to that. Um, it was about this time last year, and I'm not going to get into full details on the show, but it was about this time last year where he was going through some stuff. Yeah. And I'll, you know, if he wants to share it, that's cool. But at the same time, I was, I didn't have no answers for him. All I said was, "You need to get back in that ring, dude. Like you need to fight." You know, and that's the problem that we have today is that in our culture, in this culture of life, not Hispanic, white, black, no, in this culture that we're living in, we're trying to mince words. Yeah. I was talking to somebody last couple of weeks ago and I respect this person, you know, to death. However, this person said, you don't have a fight in you. You just have passion. And I had to ponder on that for a minute. I'm like, no, dude, I fight. I fight my spirit every day. I fight my flesh every day, but I know where my focus is at. And this is who, this is what makes me be me. Because if I came to you or Juan and said, Hey guys, everything's going to work out, man. Let's just quote this scripture and everything's going to be fine. Like unicorns and roses. Yeah. You're going to be like, dude. Like, yeah. That didn't work out for Peter. Yeah. Very well. <laughs> and, see, that, and that's the thing I was battling with my situation was because when I was going through my situation, I had everybody tell me, like, well, leave it in God's hand. You know, it's, everything's going to work out, you know, and this and that. And I'm like, okay, in reality, I understand I'm leaving it in God's hand. Well, first of all, how do you leave it in God's hands? Come on. You know what I'm saying? Second of all, in reality, I'm going crazy because my marriage is breaking. Right. The right. The thing that I dearly love. So how am I supposed to just, like, walk down the street with a big old smile and say, hey, you know, I'm blessed because God's going to handle it. When, in fact, I didn't even know how, how to even leave it in his hand until I got my apartment. Right. When I got my apartment was when I said, okay, I understand now. You're moving forward. It's it's to move forward, but also to to know that if he fix he, he can fix his, he can fix your issue with the paperwork or without a paperwork. Right. In my in my instance. So um, that's when I came to realize, okay, I got to work on me. You had to name something. You had to establish something at that moment to say, I'm moving forward. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at Joseph, one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible, the minute that he named his sons, he said, I'm naming this one because of the, of the toils in my father's house. And also because God blessed me in the land of wilderness, right? Mm -hmm. Once he established that, he was able to move forward. Yeah. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. So when his brothers came, it wasn't the the anger and the and the rejection. It wasn't all of those those uh, insecurities. Mm -hmm. It was I've moved past that, man. Yeah. Like I, this is what I've been called for. Yeah. Like this is the dream that God gave me, and it didn't go void. Yeah. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. And so when we establish pressure, pressure in the wilderness is vital is needed mm -hmm. because it, it, it launches us into that place. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I mean, men mentorship is key. And so I'm just, I'm just very, very glad that, that Ryan got that mentorship to be able to get to the place that he's at now. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, yeah, let's just keep rocking the show, man. Whatever you guys feel on your spirit to talk about, let's do it. Yeah. And, 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 and just one thing I do want to bring up, it's, it's just, I can't help. Uh, I'm not afraid of the culture. 
I'm going to engage the culture, but at the same time not compromise from the culture. Right. And it, it, it seems to me that that manhood is someone who is willing to stand for the truth even if it costs them everything. Right. Um, and uh, to me, that's, that, that's what I need to surround myself with, and that's what I need to be. At the end of the day, um, we, we, could, we could understand theology. We can understand biblical hermeneutics. We can know all those technical terms. Right. But what about when it's time to suffer for the truth? Come it's on. time to, um, you know, the, the idea that these biblical characters were, were just not gritty, I'm, I, I can't find that. The Bible does a real good job at tarnishing everybody's character but Christ. Right, and it just seems like all of them were gritty, and to me, it's especially at that time of Victory Temple. I, I know God was preparing me to say, "Hey, this is what I believe in. This is what's true, and I'm not going to stand for falsehood. I'm going to make my stand." And then, so what started to happen? It started to cultivate that that reality, and it's just to me the question pops up: Is what if your Christian experience? doesn't match up with what you what you think you know about the Bible. Come on, bro. <laughs> and it's like and it's like it's like it's great, but what about when your standing for righteousness causes you to suffer? Causes you to lose stuff or lose friends or for that matter, lose a, com- a com- I'm comfortable. Mm-hmm. And that was just a real hard lesson uh that I'm I'm recently coming out of like um that reality of like, hey, you know what? Uh, I I'd really God has a unique way of saying, hey, you don't know everything. Mm-hmm. Trust in me, uh, and and so um, when when we live when we're living our life, we have these different experiences, and I think the temptation in those experiences is to allow the experience to determine our theology, when it should be our theology to determine what our experience is, because mm-hmm. I think our experiences are so deceptive. I think we try to draw our theology out of our experience, but theology, and and that's just a lofty word. Uh, if some, it may sound lofty, but to me, it's just the truth. Mm-hmm. And we live in a world to where now we're more worried about being offended. Come on, we're man. more worried about race. We're more worried about. See, the culture now defines through experience on what our theology should be, and I just think men need to be men and say no. I'm not afraid to say th- this curse word, and this curse word is "you are wrong." Right. <laughs> that's that's the cultural curse word. You're wrong about this point of theology. You're wrong about this in life, and I think once the de- I think the devil does a real good job of stripping men of their biblical masculinity and saying, "Hey, uh, you know, it's it's offensive," and we're we're more worried about offending people with the gospel than we are winning people with Come the gospel. Come on, bro. And it's just and it's just like the the Bible's very clear. To some, it's life, and to some, it's the stench of death. The natural man does not understand, will not, will not accept. And and so we dress it up. We dress the truth up. We dress mentorship up because we're more worried about offending people. And, and, and I just have to ask myself, is that making us more effective, or, mm. or is it making us less effective? Because I think when we're worried about being politically correct in the Christian realm and Christendom, I think it— it strips the the power of the gospel, and I needed that at the time. Saying I needed someone to be like, "Hey, this is the truth. You're wrong." And uh, popular, pop, uh, contrary to popular belief, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and said the culture, the anti cultural curse word. He said, "You're wrong." Right. And then he said, "Not only that, you do not know the Bible or the power of God." And it's to me. If Jesus would stand before a group of men and, and, and offend them and say, you are all wrong, do we have the same grit as Jesus, Come on, who bro. is the God-man, who is uh, the incarnation? And, and to me, I'm starting to see the culture saying, like, I have to ask myself, I'm a Christian. Do I implement that same level of mentorship that Christ does? He wasn't afraid to tell Peter, uh, get behind me, Satan. Right. You know, it's interesting, right before that, he you know, he praised him for having a revelation that was not uh, given by flesh and bone. He confessed him as the son of Christ, uh, you know, the, the son of God. You have the words of life. And so Peter's on his high horse. He's going hard. And then the next chapter, he calls him the devil. Right. Where's that style of discipleship at? Right. Where's that? Where's that at? Right. Uh, Jesus was not worried about offending people. And and I have to you know and I have to ask myself because you know it, it says I'm not telling this to anybody or a group of people I'm asking myself um, 
I don't want to get to a point where I'm more worried about offending people Mm. because what if that worry now starts to offend the truth? Where's that balance? How can I be effective to win people and not totally just push away people, but how can I be effective to where I don't compromise truth? And to that culture, I just, I, I, I see a a femininity. I don't know if I say that right. It's feminine. It's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's where we're worried about being nice and politically correct, but um, I just didn't see that in Paul's tone when he addressed the church of Galatia. Right. He, he, he called them foolish, which is right. the equivalent in Greek of stupid. Um, he who bewitched you. Paul was offensive, uh, but with a father's heart of love and, and adoration. So I, I have to ask myself, um, that was not the level of discipleship that made me get through my 20s. Right. <laughs> it, just, it just wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, I needed that mentorship that was grit, but at the same time biblical. And I think um, true biblical Christian mentorship or the local body functions in that level of, you know, we're using a cultural term called grit. Mm -hmm. But I I think it functions in that level of accountability. Let's be real with each other. Let's not just do Sunday. Let's do life together. Let's have these hard conversations over some coffee. Come on. And let's not leave this room until we're at peace and agreement on this and that we're not have to agree on everything, but let's agree on the truth Get and the it, understanding. Yeah. And, and, and I think that level of discipleship is needed. Mm-hmm. And, and I think, I think the devil's doing a real good job of stripping the biblical, the truth, the gospel from that. And then we may still have grit, but once you take the foundation of God's word, it's sufficient. Once you take that out, the rest follows. So we mm-hmm. compromise. And, and to me, uh, we need men that are not going to compromise for truth. Right. Uh, we're going to stand for truth, and we're not worried about um, offending the culture, but we also don't want to be so dry to where we don't want to win the culture. Right. Uh, we need men that are going to stand for truth uh, unapologi- unapologetic- jet- uh, unapologetically and, right. and say, hey, but also here's this speak truth with love right. with your neighbor. That's actually a command in the Bible. Right. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think for me, that's one thing that held me grounded in, uh, and I read the Bible, I studied what theology speaks, and I think it, to engage the culture, I think, um, I think that's exactly what we need, that grit. You see right. what I'm saying? That grit that, that helps people. I think that's, that's key uh, Absolutely. to engage in the culture. And like you said, it takes the accountability and it takes the real accountability. And for me, I've told them from day one. We will never be a church that doesn't build people, period. Mm -hmm. I could care less if we have a building, honestly, because if I could, if I could take five to seven people, not me, but God in me can take five to seven people and continue to launch them out and keep that five to seven people to 15 people, whatever. That's, that's what Christ did. Mm -hmm. He walked, he talked, he loved, he rebuked Mm -hmm. four things that he did, right? And so what he did was, like you said, doing life with his disciples. And that's where my heart is at. And I have my mentors and even people, you know, guys that are pastors like, dude, you need to get a building. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, like it's not in my spirit. Like it's really, truly not in my spirit. If God gives me the building, praise God. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I can't do what I'm doing right now if I had a building. If I literally had 100 people come into my church. My leadership's not ready. I can't handle a hundred people. I can handle five. Mm-hmm. And once I once I teach the five, now now Juan could take five more, you know, and each of those five more, five more. But that's that's how Jesus did it. He he pushed all the multitudes away to say, No, I'm gonna work on these twelve and it all boiled down to the one. Period. Right. You know? So Right. And it's especially when you when you like Jesus' growth plan. Uh, is is found in John six, and he actually said things that push crowds away. And then he turned to his disciples and said, "Hey, are you going to go now?" Right. And I found that so fascinating because these are people who said they believe. These are people who got in boats and rode to the other side. And we, we can hardly get church members to you know give a tithe or an offering. They got in boats and followed Christ. And Jesus had the audacity and the boldness to say. The only reason you're following me is because you ate bread. You just want to be f- filled with bread. Don't work for bread. And then he went go so far as to say, "Is 
you don't even really believe in me, which I honestly don't think that's a good approach for any man to say that because we have to know uh, that Jesus was the God man and he, he alone knows the hearts of man. We right. don't. Uh, but but you can just <clears throat> see that Jesus was not after the crowds. He was after transforming hearts for regeneration and he was he, he was refining his people. Right. And, and and just to me it just it just seems how much of the culture has affected our biblical ecclesiology or what we think about church or you know to me the church has become a business. Mm-hmm. It's become about numbers. It, it, it's become about a pragmatic view of well, if I get this amount, I get that amount. I do this, I grow. And and so I, I've heard this philosophy, which is which is alarming to me, that if you don't have a large building, a large congregation, God is not growing you. And to me, it's it's it's, it's astonishing that people think of growth. And if that if that's the case, then it looks like the Jehovah Witnesses are doing great, right? <laughs> because they, they're growing, and they're and, growing. and I've heard this pragmatic philosophy, and I think it's, I think it's a destroying. I think it sidetracks men from biblical discipleship. That uh, you know, I'm more worried about growing these set of men to right. be who they are. But what happens is we take the focus off them and we focus on bigger things, building. And then and, and we say things like this, and I've heard it quoted like, well, it, you know, it, if it's growing, it must be God. Right. Oh, yeah. And, and it's like, well, hold on. You just gave a philosophical statement on what is God, and, and it just seems like Jesus did the opposite in John 6. Mm-hmm. He, he went to his he, – he was only worried about – how who he was revealing the the kingdom of God. He even spoke parables to push other people out, right? And to refine other people. And and it's just like, where is that level of discipleship? We're more worried about business. We're more worried about income. We're more worried about, you know, we've took on this business model of philosophy when it comes to the church, and that's alarming because now suddenly, and and I come from this background, Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm guilty of doing it. So no shade on anybody, right? uh, But shade on myself because uh, you know I come from that pragmatic. Hey, you got to get numbers. You got to have a hundred men in the home, and 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 the focus more was, was more on number growth. Uh, people in the pews, and, and you know, it was masked under good motive like excellency, which is nothing wrong with excellency. But when the primary means to discern whether something is God or not is based on numbers, is based on a particular reaction to the culture, right. I think now it's no longer based on what Scripture says because Jesus did the opposite. He wasn't worried about crowds. Right. He was worried about, um, this is why I say that to come to me, the Father must draw you. And I'm not quoting exactly John 6, so do not throw a stone at me. But uh, I think he was very clear. Hey, this is the reason why I said no one can come to me unless the Father draws me. Right. And so you have to ask yourself, is Jesus and God more worried about the quality of men growing in the respect and salvation and who they are? Or are, they, are we worried about this business mindset where we got to grow, grow, grow? And our contentment, mm-hmm. our contentment in Christ now becomes instead of I'm doing God's will, preaching the gospel, I'm I'm loving my neighbor, I'm growing my neighbor, I'm helping my neighbor. It now comes well, I have to get this certain amount of growth, and our contentment shifts. And to me, it just becomes into a form of idolatry. Instead of right. saying, "Hey, we're preaching the gospel, I'm handling what I can handle, I'm being a good steward of the small that I have," right? Because I mean, for after all, you know, a foundation, a house does only stands on the foundation that you build it on. And to me, we're more worried about experience, growth, as far as a financial and uh, material level than we are a spiritual level. Right. It's like I give you a church, but if you don't know what the Word of God says, your church won't be effective because it's you may you may even have numbers. Right. But are you really doing life? Are you really being effective in teaching people what the Bible says? And to me, it just sounds like it's a distraction. It's a mm. distraction for me, and I've seen it. I, I am the reason why I think I can art- articulate it to a certain capacity is because I was involved in it. I was the first one to do it, and I just found it to be an almost in a sense idolatrous. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and, and my contentment. I've seen other people that their contentment only lied in whether what they were doing was effective in this area, in this area. 
And so instead of being in Christ, and how effective are you if your contentment is not in Christ alone? Right. Because this idea that we're going to, you know, that uh, I'm doing God's will based off a cultural dynamic, it, it, to me it's disastrous. And I think it, I think it falls apart every time. And it's almost selfish, and and I, I've been guilty of that. And and to me, I'd, I I want to be able to say I'm more I'm doing God's will with the little <laughs> I have, right? And not trying to strive to be something that the culture tells me I need to be, or modern day Christianity tells me I need to be. Where's the grit at? Right. You know, it, it's nowadays if you get some, you get gritty and real with a couple church members, you're going to have less church members. Mm. And 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 people are more worried about offending people than offending the truth. Absolutely. Now, my leader said this. He says, "This is one of my leaders, uh, Jose Gonzalez. He's in Chicago right now. He has a home. Mm-hmm. Uh, shout out to him. He's he's in a home and he's discipling men. And um, it's called Victory Chicago. And and he, and he always had this philosophy, uh, which is is I believe is biblical. And he said, rebuke uh, without relationship equals resentment." Mm. Rebuke plus relationship equals respect. Come on, bro. And 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 at the end of the day, I don't I, I don't I I want to be able to be the person that I have such a relationship with you that I can rebuke you, that you grow in adoration and a respect for truth, that I don't always have to agree with you. Mm. I'm gonna push back on some points, but me and you are men enough to say, hey, this is where we disagree, right? But we love each other in Christ. And and to me, where's that grit at? Uh, not to throw shade on the church. The church is going to grow. God grows his church. Uh, but I also think as a church, we should engage the culture. And I think I think the culture is very feminine. I think the culture is very anti-man, anti-authority. Mm-hmm. Right. And by authority, I don't mean authority from a specific council or pastor. Right. Uh, I think councils and pastors only have the authority given to them by the word of God. I think the word of God is the final authority. And what if me and you stood firm on everything that the word of God says and commands us? I think me and you become unpopular. Well, <laughs> Go ahead, Juan. My biggest thing, too, is um, is that exactly what you're saying. But also, um, us men are, are being selfish as well because we're not even gathering together to hear the word of God, to, to be able to be built with each other. And I think that's what King's Men comes in is to say, okay, believer, non-believer, biker, low rider, whatever, we need to get together as a as a un- unite with as each a other, unit. as a unit, and build each other mm-hmm. to, so that way we can learn how to get that grit back, learn about the gospel, learn about being a man under God that right. God wanted men to be. Absolutely. But if we can't unite them, then we can't build anything. There has to be that there has to be that gathering because if there's not a barbecue, if there's not fajita meat on the grill, if there's not that, it's gonna be less chance of men to gather. Period. Yeah. Because especially in the DFW Metroplex, now I'm going there. Okay. Mm-hmm. You got so many big churches that people the way you win a person is how you're going to keep that person. Mm-hmm. So if all they're doing is coming to an event, then you've got to be the bigger event to get those that were at the at the at the big event to come to your little event yeah. because they're looking for the masses. The they're they're looking for the shebang. They're looking for the taco trucks. They're looking for all that. I mean, no shade. I love tacos. I make them all day long. <laughs> However, the truth is, is that if if we win people, I want Juan with Christ. I want him with building him, right? Doing what I'm supposed to do. Now, the other side of the spectrum, we as Christians, as men of God, we can't be so fixed on what we know versus what God wants us to do. Mm-hmm. Because here's the truth. Sometimes we know far too much that we don't leave room for us to grow. Mm -hmm. So Ryan's 30 years old. I'm 47. He's taught me a lot today because I haven't been in that realm of theology. I haven't been in that realm of, of that type of discipleship. Was I discipled? Great. Absolutely. But my sphere of influence, my lane that I stay in is real talk in your face 
Here's how you use the spiritual for the practical. Let's rock this thing called Jesus, right? And so we have to get to the place as men that I'm not worried about, I'm not worried about competition. Yeah. I was at work the other day and one of just somebody there was, you know, invited them to Set Free Life Church. And this person said, well, I go here. There's no competition. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, (laughs) I'm not here to compete. Oh, they said there's no competition? I said, I'm not here to compete with that dude. Yeah. I'm here to bring the the gospel, period. I help people build their identity to understand who they are in Christ Jesus. If you want to come, cool. And that's what that's what came back to my mind was people are about the big. Yeah. And no shade on that. Mm-hmm. Like no shade on that whatsoever. Right? Yeah. But at the same time, I'm not out to try to build something that God has not called me to do. He told me, you build them one by one. It's Period. Like, it's like having um I I don't know if y'all know, but like when we go to, when you go to uh, out of town Mm -hmm. and you don't know where you're going, so you're hungry and you're like, well, this one looks kind (laughs) of ran down, hole in the wall, but it's the only thing here to eat. And you know what? It's better than the... The The hospitality is better because they don't have to worry about all of the bells and whistles and all the shiny objects and all the, and again, no shade. But they're not worried about the smoke. They're not worried about the lights. They're not worried about the bandstand. They're not worried about all of that stuff. People want red letter Bible, period. They want to hear what Jesus has for them because we're in a a, a broken and hurting world. God, God spoke to me in 2015 and said, before the world can even come to Christ, the church has to be delivered, period. Because there's so many of us that get lost in the pew that we get lost. You weren't even part of my ministry. You were part of a bigger ministry. And you said, I need help. Along with another few men from the same ministry saying, we're getting lost in the shuffle, dude. Like we, like literally you didn't know me. Another guy didn't know me. He's like, I heard about you. So I need help. Not to boast on on myself. I'm boasting on Christ. Mm -hmm. But it's because we're we're in the place where people want the intimacy. They want the real talk. They want, how do I get over this? How do I overcome this? Amen. Amen. So we're going to put a pin in that real quick. Are you looking to lower your energy bills and fight the increasing cost of energy? How about increasing the value of your home? Well, then do we have the answer for you? Visit our friends at southernsolartx.com for all of your solar energy needs. These guys are fantastic. Their heart's desire is to see each and every one of their customers turn into long-term champions at paying off their electric bills. For a free consultation, you can reach our friends at 817-751-8911 to set up an appointment or drop them an email at contact at southernsolartx.com and all of this information will be in the podcast details below. Now, back to our show. All right, well, welcome back to the King's Men podcast. Um, I got my guest, Ryan Griffin, and my right-hand man. We got uh, Juan Frias. And so, uh, you know, we were talking about, man, we were talking about so much stuff, right? But one of the things that that stood out to me, and, and, you know, I want to break this question down. How do you shift from, because we've both said it, we've been guilty of, the marketing. We've been guilty of the business side. We've been guilty of the numbers. We've been guilty of that area. So how does a person, how does a man out of your own words, Ryan, be able to make that shift? What caused you to make the shift in your mind and in your spirit to say, you know what? It's not about that. I think, um, for me, it was the reality of having a heart for God's word, um, instead of being concerned about what pragmatically works best, it's it's God. Am I honoring you in your word? I think I think uh, the psalmist in Psalms one nineteen eighteen kind of embodies it for me. He said, "Open up my eyes 
this is a prayer because he knows we all go before the word of God and, and sometimes we just don't see nothing. But he has this prayer to me that in, encapsulates the heart that I think what men need to adopt. And this hasn't changed. This is, this is every, there needs to be a revival every uh, such and such generation with this reality. It's He said, open up my eyes. This is verse 18. Open up my eyes that I may behold wondrous things in your word or your law. Mm -hmm. And I think the reality of it is, is we need men who love the word of God. Because um, church philosophy, life, uh, experience, those can knock us off track. And they're so good at doing that. Uh, Busyness, uh, insecurities. I think those are so good at knocking us off track. I think what men need is to adopt a love for God's word. And, and, and I like the psalmist. The psalmist is not just sitting like, oh, I need to adopt a love. The psalmist is like, change my heart. Right. I need to love your word. And you're going to have to put that love for your word in me. Because I think I think we need to understand that the Word of God is the final authority, and that will never lead us astray. And I think the Word of God is 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 the same Word that God spoke the universe into existence. Right. It's the same Word that um, that is the power of God unto salvation. It's the truth, and I think truth carries within and of itself that grit. Mm-hmm. I think uh, that's why it should be balanced by grace, because truth is tough. Right. Paul said, have I now become your enemy because I've told you the truth? I think how men get there is that we stand on the authority of Scripture. I think what this culture is 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 experiencing is there is a lack of belief in the sufficiency of Scripture, therefore mm-hmm. affecting what we believe about the authority of Scripture. Um, in, in the Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy, it's a statement that they came out with um, in the ni- 1978, uh, and, and I have to agree with it. It, it. it literally says, we affirm that holy scriptures are to be received as the authoritative word of God. Mm. But you see now, because of our culture and because of um, our culture invading the church, what's the final authority? What we feel? This supernatural experience that I had with the Holy Ghost 13 years ago or two days ago, <laughs> right. uh, or, or my feelings, or or my, my beliefs, or my, you know, what is the final authority? And I think the Word of God stands as a rock when everything else crumbles. Mm. And I think that's what Jesus said. Jesus said, um, "The wise man is the one who." obeys my word Mm. he built his on the in the parable of the two builders he built his house on the rock and i like this because he didn't say if the winds and came he says when When. it's gonna happen right life's gonna happen evil's going to happen bad things are going to happen but what happens when we're not grounded in that objective absolute authoritative word of god let's sit down let's get back to the bible why does it say this who cares if it rubs me wrong good i might just being I, that that's kind of you know i'm being a disciple i don't oh. think jesus was always worried about pleasing his disciples mm-hmm. i think he rubbed his disciples wrong on a lot of areas but he did it out of love and i think we're so we're so worried about See, the church, I think, has adopted this false ideology of what we call love. Mm. I think, I think it's, it's, a, it's a feminine love. It's not a biblical love. Wow. And, and, and what happens is when you take away truth from love, I don't think it's effective. Right. And we're actually being disobedient. I think, I think we should talk about the truth of doctrine. I think we should talk about the truth of how, as Christians, we should stand on abortion, homosexuality. Right. I think we should stand on that truth. <clears throat> and, and, and to me, when you're more worried about the bells and whistles, the pragmatics of uh, how can I win and keep people, mm-hmm. here's what you don't do. You do not preach on homosexuality. Right. It just seems like every sermon on homosexuality dies the death of a thousand qualifications well i know friends that are homosexual i love and instead of just telling me what the word says you got to give 45 minutes of an introduction on why you're qualified and why you love pastor don't give me your heart give me the word 
Right. I need the word. I want to know what this says. And I think the truth is naturally offensive mm. because me and you – see, I have a biblical worldview as far as I believe me and you are naturally sinners. And, right. and the truth will rub us wrong. Mm-hmm. But that's how we grow in love. We need to be exposed to the truth of God's word. And so this idea that theology has been pushed uh, as just mere head knowledge that we shouldn't do this. And and, and, and matter of fact, people that I've known uh, that have effective chur- churches, they have doled down messages Right. that honestly I think to a point where it's now compromising truth so that they can win the masses. Mm-hmm. And, I, I, and I think that's that pragmatic, well, if it works, then it must be true. But as opposed to the Word of God, where it says, this is what the truth says, are you going to hold to it? I mean, Jesus is clear. Uh, Sanctify them in my Word. Your Word is truth. <clears throat> right. And he said, Scripture cannot be broken in John 10. He also said, you know, um, it's interesting. He, al- he also said that Scripture was spoken he says, have you not read what has been spoken? And that's interesting. I have to ask myself, and I have to ask the church, do we have the same view of Scripture that Jesus does? Hmm. He, he, he rebuked people because they didn't use the Old Testament the right way. Right. He, they, you know, regardless of however smart we think the Pharisees were, um, he said they were wrong about everything. Right. And I love that. He said, you're wrong. Like, when is the last time somebody set you down and said, hey, I, I, th- I think you're wrong in this area? Right. Uh, do we even surround ourselves with men who say, you know, I, I call people, I call pastors, and I give them an idea, and they will give me pushback. Mm-hmm. And I look for that. I don't like it. It's not comfortable. Right. But since when did I get to a point where I can't be challenged on what I believe? Right. That's horrible. I I, I don't wanna I wanna be challenged and I don't wanna be so sensitive to, I'm so more worried about oh you hurt my feelings. Right. To, what if I'm unbiblical? Uh we need to talk about those things and I think culture doesn't want us to talk about those things. I think we need to deal with theology, the word of God. That passion for God's word, I think. If we stir that back up again, I think I think I think the church, I think young people, uh, all people are, are ready to hear a real unapologetic message through a loving but stern reality. Hey, this is what the Bible teaches. This is what we're going to stand on. We're not going to deviate from this. Right. And and not only that, it's going to help you. Right. It, it, it's going to help you. It may not pay your bills at the end of the month. You may have to go work hard for that. Mm-hmm. But this will, when life hits, when this situation hits, you're going to have something that you know is true. Amen. Even when everything looks like a lie around you. So I think stirring for the Word of God, that, that praying, I need a heart for the Word of God. I think once we get back to what Jesus taught, the Bible teaches, the Word of God is is this, that, and the other. It's sufficient. Mm-hmm. It has everything you need. It's right there in front of you. And I think it's a gift from the Holy Spirit to have the Bible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Man, thank you, bro. That was a jam-packed, drop the mic, boom, shaka. But one of the things that I, w- I would like to also add to that is that as far as me, as far as building set free uh, ministry, um, there was a point in time where everything crumbled and all I had left was just leadership. And then at that point, leadership left. And so something that had uh, resounded in my spirit that I had heard years ago, if you are what you have and you lose it, then who are you? And that was the statement that God really spoke into my spirit. Like, okay, so all of this is gone. It's stripped away. Who are you? Who are you in me? Who are you? You lost your business. Now you lost your ministry. You lost all of this stuff. This stuff is gone. It's stripped away. It's gone. You're naked. You're vulnerable. You're in a place. You're in wilderness. Who are you? And that's when God began to rebuild me to understand, okay, now I know what my calling is because I was worried about the numbers. I was worried about all of that. And when I got to the place to where I'm at now, and I'm 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 still not done yet. God's still not done with me. However, Amen. <laughs> I will continue to tell anyone that comes to our church, this may not be for you because we don't have a children's ministry. Heck, we don't even have a keyboard. We turn on YouTube and we sing a song. We pray, we get into the word. And sometimes we just get right into the word, period. And so people are are in this place and half of my congregation are people that I work with. So everywhere that we go is the mission field. 
And we get caught up in this whole thing. Well, I got to go to Africa. I got to go here. I got to go to Houston. I, I got to do this revival. No, it's in everywhere that you go is the mission field, period. Amen. No matter what you're doing, <clears throat> everything is the mission field. And so the other thing that uh, dropped in my spirit as you were talking about is that we've taken relevant to conformity. We've conformed in this thing called relevancy. Where it's, well, we got to be relevant with the culture. We got to be relevant with the, with the youth. We got to be relevant with the teens and all of that. And yes, we do to some point. And I like what you said, skinny jeans and, and a degree doesn't make you a pastor. I mean, I've had, I mean, seriously, I've, I've, I've seen those memes of the hats and the skinny jeans and it says, you know, the ideal worship leader. No, dude, a worship leader is somebody who really, truly loves God who is living out Psalms 139, search my heart and see if there's anything wicked inside of me. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. And so oh, yeah. truth is, is that if we're going to get back to the grit, and I'm going to have to go back to listen to this podcast because there's so much information that you brought, which was powerful. But for us to get back to the grit, we got to go back to the core. We got to go back to the word of God to say, you know what? This is truth. This is truth and not break it down and justify it. Well, in this, in this context, it says this. No, sometimes you just got to read the word for what it is, Mm -hmm. period. And this whole idea of, of like you were saying, just making everyone feel comfortable. If you don't have the newest seats, if you, you know, one of my mentors said, Paul, listen, the Holy Spirit can do so much more in your house setting than it can ever do in a 5,000 congregation building period. He said, because there's more freedom there. He said, trust me. I mean, this dude, this dude has built 27 churches, launched 27 churches. This dude is like in your face, you know, I'm pastor Greg, this dude is the bomb. But he said, Paul, he said, you know, you're, you're talking about all this because we're going into 2020. He said, but check yourself in about two weeks. You'll be back to what you know you're supposed to be doing. Don't base just because it's a new year that God's going to do this totally new thing Mm -hmm. because that's not how it always works. Sometimes the call and the mission is for 10 years. But we get into this whole thing of life of New Year's resolutions and this and that. And let's get our goals and let's do that. And I teach that stuff. I'm a coach. But at the same time, it's like, okay, what's important to you? The people that I work with, I'm like, okay, so when you once you start hitting all of your goals and you start seeing the goals that you're not hitting, that goes to tell me and you that those goals are not relevant to where you want to go. Mm-hmm. So let's focus on what's going to continue to build you. That's that's the word of God. You follow what I'm saying? And continue to keep rocking this thing for Jesus. And so I just think this show was just actually both these shows because this is two shows all in one. I'm going to edit this stuff out, but I think it's awesome because we're three men. We got one disciple that's new. Yeah. I mean, you've been in Christianity, what, two years? Two years. Okay. Um, you've been in Christianity for a minute, you know? A little bit. I backslid back in 2009, uh, no, 2007 and eight. I thought, you know, I thought I was on fire for God, but I still had to burn some stuff out. Matter of fact, when you met me, I had just came back to the Lord maybe a year and a half. You know what I'm saying? But it takes those moments, I think, that will really define where we want to go. Because like I tell people, I don't promote going to backslide. However, that was the most pivotal point of my life is when at one point I heard the voice of God and then I went a year and a half without hearing God. I would have rather not heard his voice the first time than, than to not hear his voice in my wilderness. That's a tough season to be at. Oh yeah. Unfortunately, some of us that are knuckleheads need that season. Yeah. And that's where I was at. And when I came back, I said, all right, God, I'm here. Yeah. Whatever you have me to do, whatever you call me to do, I'm going to do it. And so I just want to thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Um, for coming on the show. Yeah. I know we're going to have another one. Uh, yeah. Not sure it. when. But um, I'm just going to put this out there. Ryan is uh, looking at creating his own podcast. That's right. And so just be on the lookout if you want to share the title of what Theo- you call it. Theology Matters. <clears throat> awesome. Theology Matters with Austin Ryan. Yeah. It, it, I'll be, uh, 
I'll be letting y'all guys know when I'm dropping that. But be looking out for my podcast, Theology Matters. I would love all of you to join me, and let's explore life together and deal with all these issues through the Word of God. That's, so Theology Matters, be looking out for that. Amen. So, Juan, you got any closing comments, bro? No, just, just uh, soaking it in. Uh. Just soaking it in. It's a lot, <laughs> lot to hear. Uh, but, like, I'm new, so hearing him speak is, um, like, my wheels are turning, like, okay, it's, it's, it's great stuff, but my on my side, it's like, okay, how do you reach men that don't know that stuff? Right. Because Ro used to come visit me, hey, you need God. Dude, I'm not trying to hear that. Right. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Until, that, until my breaking point came mm-hmm. was when I finally said, okay, I'll go to your church, go check it out. Right. And then I never missed a beat. Amen. And then I ran across Pastor uh, Greg mm-hmm. Sermon, and it was gangster. Yeah. It was street. He was talking about the, when they lowered the guy into the house, he's like, you know, he, he put it on street words. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay. Right. I'm understanding this now. So <clears throat> I think that's just where I'm going to go back and think about everything he said, listen to the podcast, and start learning because it's all about learning. Mm-hmm. Learning. Amen two different three different mindsets and and like you said building a game plan and getting to these these guys man because these guys uh, we're losing ourselves we're going up in the junkyard Mm -hmm. you know iron sharpens iron bro yes sir but so i appreciate it ryan thank you pastor paul absolutely well guys this is coming to a close for the kingsman podcast we want to thank you so much for joining in and once again guys you can some Hit that subscribe button. Drop us a review so we get on a higher level. Um, it's not about the level, but it's about getting on a platform that everyone can actually be in this room. <laughs> because that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to create this culture of what we talk about in a room. Now we can share it with thousands of people. So Amen. once again, this is Pastor Paul, your Set Free Life Coach. I want to thank you so much for joining in. Uh, Juan, you want to say your goodbyes? Good. Uh, Juan Freel of Set Free Life Church and the King's Men's Ministry. Thank you. Hey Amen. Ryan, you want to say a few words? God bless you, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. We'll see you on the next show. God bless.